the statement um, that Steve made in talking about um, culture and Christ and the cross, and he made the comment that if there's no cross, um, someone has to pay. And uh, we were talking about that with respect to, I think, discipline. And he was talking about discipline of his own son, uh, which has just um, struck my heart because it's the same way I feel about, felt about when I, when I disciplined my own children, that we're constantly looking for restoration. Uh, we're not looking for a pound of flesh. And, and so um, constantly just yeah, naming the sin, um, but redeeming it um, and restoring that child and restoring ourselves every time we restore a child. Because we all know except for the grace of God, there go I, and we've also been there many times, right? Um, so I just wrote to him and said, thanks for the reminder, brother, that the world without Christ has to believe this. And so we've, we've met a lot of people who don't have the cross, and uh, they need their pound of flesh daily, right? But um, so that Steve gives reminders like that all the time. Don't get arrogant, okay? I like um, it. You like it, he loves it. Um, but he's given a couple of talks um, during our teacher um, training and such, and I always walk away with something that I just keep thinking about things that he says. And I, I add to that by saying that um, we had a, another a teacher breakout where everybody was getting involved in a discussion that I was facilitating. I wasn't leading much. I just facilitated because they were all doing a lot of the talking. And we, we have a lot of really bright but, but godly faculty members here. And, um, and they're really eager to talk about how we integrate faith and uh, the disciplines that we teach. So you can uh, rest assured that that is happening. And um, so it's a privilege to, uh, to know all of these, and as Steve uh, represents all of us as a faculty, as he talks about what it is that we're looking for and what we're building in terms of a school culture in Christ. Steve, thanks. Well, welcome back. And so it begins. Uh, <laughs> it begins on a great note there. Um, if you've been through the grammar stage, um, welcome to dialectic. Uh, you're, you're going to really start to see all the things that the students have been doing over the years begin to blossom right around this time. Uh, it's, it's particularly humbling uh, when your eighth graders start taking logic and they start correcting you uh, in your fallacies. Um, uh, and at some point you do want to just tell them to shut up and, uh, <laughs> and, and be done with it. And, um, and it is, it, it does, it's funny because I teach here, I, I have done logic, and I, I do, I get into these logic wars with my children, uh, with my uh, daughter who, who, who took uh, logic, and, and, and at some point, you know, the, the difference is, is I'm old and I'm tired, and they're young, and they just want to keep, you know, they just got their black belt, and they just want to keep fighting, and they're, it's, I think it is okay to just eventually say to them, you know, look, I'm your dad, uh, I, I pay for the food you eat. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't care if I'm wrong, uh, you ain't doing it. So, uh, there's a logic to that. There's a logic they know not of. Um, I want to, uh, for the, and of course for rhetoric students, uh, I wanted to, to paint sort of a broad picture of what we're doing here. Um, this is an education we didn't get, and so we're always relearning, we're always refocusing, we're always uh, thinking afresh what we're doing here, this incredible gift uh, that we've been given. And so um, I wanted to start by uh, reading some excerpts. Uh, I'm assuming everybody here, most people read the Delaware Today article, if you didn't, Shame. Uh, there were two articles, to, to be precise, in the, in the August of, or July Delaware to July Delaware today, and um, one of them was a, a lead uh, editorial by Robert Martinelli entitled "Does Delaware Have a Blind Spot in the Education Arena? The Success Story of Tolo's Classical Learning Style Cannot Be Ignored." And here's just some excerpts. Tim Dernlin, headmaster of Tall Oaks, was working toward a doctorate in education when a professor told his cohort, we all know the system is broken, stop talking about fixing it. The implication was clear, the public school system is beyond repair. It's time for a new one, go forth and create it, close quote. 
And Martinelli basically goes on um, to point out that this, this is what classical education is. It is a new kind of school system. He goes on, quote, by leading them through the grammar, logic, and rhetoric stages in language, the arts and humanities, math, and science. Tall oak students encounter ideas that many others never hear about until they reach college. I have to demure here, I'm a college professor, and I can tell you that, that they don't necessarily get it in college either, but uh, I digress. Uh, going on, one result is that a couple years ago, Tall Oak scored the second highest SAT scores in the state. It's hard to argue with that kind of success, so why don't our policymakers look more closely at what happens there? And he continues, Tall Oak still accepts students of all abilities. Its high minority population has closed the performance gap. And Tall Oak seems to be better than the public schools at identifying and educating students with special needs. Those SAT scores are all the proof that should be needed. Classical education was the model of public American education until 125 years ago. I can't help thinking that a return to some of its fundamentals would be the greatest reforms we could make." Close quote. Now I'm uh, very, uh, obviously very appreciative of Martinelli's uh, editorial. Um, he does, if you'll notice, sidestep the specifically Christian distinctives uh, that our classical education uh, brings to bear on the student. Uh, so he's actually a, a bit incorrect. It was not classical education that marked our public school system up to a bit over a century ago. It was classical Christian education. Are you familiar with the New England Primer, published around 1777? Uh, it, it was the public school textbook. It taught students the Lord's Prayer, the Apostles' Creed, the Ten Commandments, the Westminster Shorter Catechism, with the students who are learning little jingles like, in Adam's fall we sin all. Um, Bible and prayer were central to our school curriculum in many respects all the way up uh, through the 20th century. Uh, it was June of, of 1962 that the United States Supreme Court declared that school, uh, a school uh, prayer approved by the New York Board of Regents was unconstitutional, violated this separation of church and state. Uh, and then the following year they, they threw out Bible reading as well. And so we tend to think of education today as constitutive of techniques and approaches that can be assessed through SAT scores and through college placement and acceptance. And the Bible and prayer simply have nothing to do with it. You have to let that hit you. In 1962, we decided that we can educate children without prayer. And then in 1963, we decided we can actually give a sound public national education without the Bible. And we believe that's normal. We've been conditioned, uh, socialized, to think that that's normal. We're, we add things here. We're a faith-based uh, education system. All education is faith-based. The question is, what's your faith in, right? All education rests on rules, understandings, and goals considered absolute and unquestionable. Um, if I get pulled over on the side of the road for speeding by a police officer and I say, you know, I really don't like that law, what's he going to say to me? Well, if he's nice to me, <laughs> he'll say, uh, he'll say uh, well, it's too bad, you still broke it. You see, the law defines me. I don't define it. The law is absolute. The law is unquestioned. What if I want to change the law? How do I do it? By obeying the law, right? Petitions, elections, what have you. The only way I can change that law is by obeying the law. We all live by rules, understandings, and goals that we consider absolute, infallible, unquestionable, and they are taken on by faith. It's called religion. So this whole idea of the separation between the state and religion is impossible. We just have a new religion. It's called the secular state. And we think it's normal. We think it's natural. So 
I think there was a very uh, revealing survey taken by the uh, Barna Group called the State of the Bible 2013. And the survey found that most Americans do want the Bible taught uh, in public schools. About 70% believe that uh, this would go a long way in fostering good moral character in the students and so forth. But the survey was fascinating. Half of those who wanted the Bible taught in public schools did not think there should be a Bible-based curriculum a curriculum centered on the Bible because such a curriculum would end up favoring one religion over another religion, which is not permitted in a secular society where the public square is supposedly uh, religious and neutral. So we want the Bible taught, uh, but with very strict boundaries, which in effect simply reaffirm our secular norms that are relatively new and we accommodate the Bible to those norms. What's the problem with this picture here? What's the problem with the secular vision of a public square that's religiously neutral? Remember, police are not religiously neutral. Well, as Christians, we believe that the paradise that was lost due to Adam and Eve's fall has in fact been restored in Christ. We believe that the tree of life that was banned because of our sins has returned to us in the form of a cross. We bathe in the rivers of Eden in our baptisms and we eat and drink of its Edenic nourishment in our communion, our Eucharistic meal. This is the Christian gospel, that through Christ, the grace of God is redeeming a fallen cosmos. Through the gift of the Spirit purchased by the purging of sin through Christ's sacrificial death, the world is being restored back to Edenic life. And what that means is that everything that the gospel touches begins to blossom in newness of life. Everything the gospel touches, everything the gospel, everything the gospel touches blossoms into Edenic life. And so, that of course includes education. What's wrong with the secular vision of education is it in effect quarantines the gospel. It, it, it removes the gospel from the public square. The gospel is not allowed to bring its own spirit-filled regeneration to economic, <coughs> political, and educational endeavors. And so all of our secular education attempts, like everything in an unredeemed creation, eventually begin to wither away. And so I think this is really what Tall Oaks is is all about, particularly our upper school. This is why we have the results that we have. When education is touched by the gospel, it experiences a Narnia-like springtime. And it's this gospel-centered reality that's the sustaining force behind everything that we do here. Now I'm thinking of three ways in particular, sort of three takeaways of how this gospel is brought to bear in upper school, particularly upper school education, but it goes across, uh, across all the grades. <clears throat> First, a, a gospel-centered approach sees education as enculturation. Education is not about simply imparting a bunch of facts and information to the student. Education is about shaping and molding habits within the student that are oriented towards this Edenic life in Christ. So, our students are successful because they develop these magnificent and wonderful and godly habits that come out of this encounter with the Gospel and therefore their humanity begins to flourish. So no matter what they end up doing, they do it beautifully, they do it well. 
That's again, this is what the secular mind can't wrap around. The secular mind is solely looking for techniques and information and manuals to produce the, all the, that's all that, that was, that's all the goals. That's no child left behind, that's race to the top. It's some kind of quantifiable data that we can assess that says, oh, look at these little computers and machines, look what they're doing. That's not how we do it here. Remember, we didn't have this subject here. We, had, we were machines. Right? We, we were produced in the end. You see, you see what a public school looks like, right? What does it look like? A factory. And we have an assembly line of students that go through that, that factory. And then we're taught how to think like machines. We're only taught and what's the whole purpose? Graduate so you can go into another machine. Secondly, a gospel-centered approach sees Christ as the center of our curriculum. Human flourishing is found in the renewal of our humanity in Christ. And so all of our courses enable our students to encounter a synthetic vision of Christ. Christ redeems our thinking, and so we spend time learning logic, math, science. Uh, we even think of homework differently. This is a tough one, isn't it? Homework involves contemplation. Contemplation of thinking deeply about things, of de uh, developing attentiveness, which in turn consecrates our thinking, which reflects the, cri the, the fact that Christ has redeemed our minds. So interesting. I do it all the time. Are you done with your homework yet? It's like we're doing homework just to finish it. But imagine if we called it contemplation. Are you done with your divine contemplation? <laughs> do you want them done? No. You want them doing it for